Welcome back. Uh, last time I misspoke and I said it was John Adams that wrote that essay near the end of the half hour. Of course, it was James Madison in number 43 uh, factions. Today, now we're going, we're, we're moving towards uh, David Truman's defending pluralistic politics. And Truman talks in terms of this idea of a competition of interest groups. So we have individuals right different individuals and they join groups and these different groups then compete in elections and that gives us public policy and other individuals can join and there could be you can have <clears throat> you can be a member of many different groups and you can be a member uh, and different groups may be competing uh, even against themselves for example Catholics who are pro-choice right uh, people might give money to their Catholic Church but they're also might be giving money to pro-choice uh, uh, political organizations so Truman goes and is very Truman is very uh, uh, this is a very famous article, and as the authors talk in terms of uh, peoples are members of people are members of groups, and in these groups, uh, the group has influence and the individual has influence. Again, let's recall the criteria that we use: independence of action. Independence of action, right? <clears throat> Truman talks more in terms of the group, the ideals of the group causes uh, a determinant of behavior. That determinant then becomes uh, an act of acceptance. He says on page, again, at the number 45, on page 249, this power is exhibited in two closely interdependent ways. In the first place, the group exerts power over its members, an individual's group affiliations largely determines his attitudes, values, and the frames of reference in terms of which he interprets his experience. So, again, using uh, the language that we have developed, one would say, right, the pseudo-environment is influenced by groups, which is perfectly, which is perfectly reasonable. It's perfectly understandable. Of course, what happens when what happens when there is a decision or there is a crisis? Uh, and and uh, Truman does not seem to really address this, but in the cases in the case that we're we're discussing, he looks at it from a macro to micro, right? It's from the uh, the group, the many, to the individual. And so he says again, the price of acceptance, right, is once you accept these norms. Once you accept these behaviors, then you will become part of us. You will then be a member of the group. An individual's present group relationships, it is also may be derived from past affiliations, such as childhood family, as well as from groups for which the individual aspires to belong and whose characteristics shared attitude he also holds. In the second place, the group, if it is or becomes an interest group, which any group in a society may be, exerts power over other groups in the society when it successfully imposes claims upon them. So he goes to a further definition of what an interest group is, right? An interest group, an interest group is any group that exerts pressure 
on another group. Well, how do they exert pressure, you may ask? And the question again becomes one of what is the established procedure to gain access to government? And that would be through elections. Now, again, going back to our going back to our discussion of political parties, if you remember the definition of political parties are activists who organize to win elections to operate the government and to determine public policy. Well, interest groups, most interest groups, are groups. Now, some are affiliated with political parties, right? What do I mean by that? Affiliated. Well, it means that they form an alliance. They form an alliance. And so, again, if we're talking about uh, labor unions, labor unions tend to be democratic with the Democratic Party because in 1933, uh, FDR recognized uh, these groups. Um, again, different religions have different, at different times, have been allied with different political parties. Uh, for most of, the, most of the 20th century, the Catholic Church was allied with the Democratic Party, especially up until the mid-1960s. Then by the time Ronald Reagan uh, and Richard Nixon were elected, the Catholic Church was basically 50-50. Now, today we have uh, the Catholic Church is divided on the sort of political uh, boundary between, as I said before, the pro-life question but also now more questions of social justice and immigration. So again, different groups have different, may have different uh, ideas or may be divided amongst the membership themselves. But he defines, again, Truman defines an interest group as a group that wants to impose its will on others, on other groups. He goes on, many interest groups, again on page 249, Many interest groups probably, an increasing proportion in the United States, are politicized. That is, either from the outset or from time to time in the course of their development, they make their claims through or upon institutions of government. Both the form and functions of the government in turn are a reflection of the activities and claims of such groups. The Constitution writing proclivities of Americans clearly reveal the influence of demands from such sources and the statutory creation of new functions reflect their continuing operation. Many of these forms and functions have received such widespread acceptance from the start or in the course of time, they appear to be independent of the overt activities of organized interest groups. So in the summer of 2020, you have a group uh, that gained prominence and gained um, a lot of resources called the Black Lives Matter group, right? Black Lives Matter. Now, the question is, is this group going to become an interest group? So they have taken and done protests. Corporates, corporations have given them resources, have given them money. And now the question is, okay, so is the slogan, is the street protest, is that going to be part of the public policy process? Black Lives Matter, are they, are they now going to become an interest group? Not just a group that is, yes, politicized, but it was, it's a group that now has an agenda. The group, will they uh, hire lobbyists? Will they use these resources for extending their agenda? Um, that's a question that, that has yet to be determined as, as of this recording. However, I would suspect that yes, that's what they were going, that's what they that's what they will become. Because ultimately what will happen is you are going to have a group that has to show results. Not only to its members, but to other groups. So you have other groups in the civil rights uh, arena and now they have a new competitor, according, again, according to Truman. And that's, again, just making a, 
just making an observation, just making a, uh, a, uh, an example. So he goes on and talks about what is lobbying, right? And on page 250, he says, the institutions of government are centers of interest-based power. Let me repeat that. The institutions of government are centers of interest-based power. Interest-based power. Right, so exactly the opposite of what Madison was saying, right? Madison was saying the Republican form of government, if it's a large Republican form of government, it is going to be buffered from interest groups, especially from local interest groups, factions he called them, right? Well, again, Truman's talking in terms of our government institutions are based on interest groups. So again, if I am, and we'll talk about this, uh, in the next section, not the next, next video, but the next section um, when we talk about Congress. And so the question is, if I'm from and get elected by farmers, I want to be in the Agricultural Committee. If, I, if I'm from a district that has a big military base, such like San Antonio, Texas, or San Diego, California, I want to be on Armed Services. So the interest, right, if who do people want to give me campaign contributions, and who do people want to help me in this alliance with my political party is the interest groups that are local or the interest groups that have the same uh, convivial um, point of view. So lobbying is, as Truman says, in order to make claims, political interest groups will seek access to key points of the decision within these institutions. Again, they are trying to get access points, trying to get key senators, key congressmen, key celebrities, key people that will influence that decision. And that's basically what all lobbying is, right? Lobbying is you hire somebody, probably a lawyer, or probably an ex-office holder, and they call up people and say, I think this is something that you should think about, or I'm in favor of this proposal or bill or policy, et cetera. Such points, meaning such access points, such uh, intersections of interests, are scattered throughout the structure, including not only the formally established branches of government, but also the political parties in their various forms and the relationship between governmental units and other interest groups. So again, we look in terms of power. And if we define power as the ability to make someone do what we want them to do, you can see how in this in the scatter, what do you call the scattering points of the legislative process, but also in the informal, right? The informal process, lobbying can take many forms. The extent which a group achieves effective access to the institutions of government is the result of a complex interdependent factors. For the sake of simplicity, these may be classified in three somewhat overlapping categories. One, again I'm on page 250, one, factors relating to the group's strategic position in society. Okay, so again, the institutions are interest-based power. What or how do we classify or how do we determine who has power? One, first, is the strategic position of the group. So traditionally, teachers unions have been very powerful. Uh, civil rights, some civil rights organizations have been very powerful. Uh, unions have been very powerful. Groups that have not been, or groups that have lost power. Veterans groups have lost power, right, or are less powerful than they were, such as after World War II. And you also have uh, manufacturing lobbyists or uh, people who are advocating um, uh, different, different positions that hold their pretty unpopular positions. The Flat Earth Society probably is, no offense to anyone who believes that the Earth is flat. So what is their strategic position in society, right? Who's their membership? 
Does their membership have resources? So again, the most powerful lobbying group in the country is AAR, the AARP, right? The American Association of Retired Persons. Why? Because retired people have resources. They have money, a little bit of money maybe. They also have, what, time. So they can volunteer for campaigns or they can volunteer to be poll watchers or whatever. And finally, they vote. Old people vote, young people do not. That's what the data tells us. So uh, the, the AARP is a very, very influential and a very, very important organization because their strategic position in our society. Everyone, if you live past 50 years old, everyone is a, can become a member. So, right, there's no exclusion. All you have to be is 50 years old. The second factor he talks about is the, the internal characteristics of the group, as I talked about, about retired people, right? So the internal characteristics of the group. And again, in our society, as I mentioned with Black Lives Matter or the Occupy Wall Street people, right? So the difference between the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street people, if, if you remember them from 2008 or 9 or Black Lives Matter, is what? Do they vote? The Tea Party people basically took over the Republican Party. They voted. They knew the structure. They took over the party. Now, will these other groups take over the Democratic Party or, or be, instead of being protesters, do they become voters? Because that is really the currency in our public policy process, at least right now, is when we talk about political parties winning the election, when we talk about the media, money, right? So again, we see some of these groups are getting money. Now, are they going to be able to convert that to the internal characteristics of instead of protesting, do you vote? We'll see, right? We will see. And the third factor is peculiar to the governmental institutions themselves, right? So are they, right? The third factor is the peculiar characteristics of the governments, the government institution, right? So Again, you have a group, let's say uh, you have an interest group that is uh, trying to lobby or trying to convince people that smoking marijuana is a good thing. Well, the problem is, right, that we have other groups saying smoking anything is a bad thing. And so if I'm a congressman or if I'm a senator who has run on office out of family values or being protecting children, that might be, I might not even talk to you because of your the, in, the inherent institutional characteristics that I have. So these three basically form the basis of the competition that Truman is talking about. So again, what do you do if you lobby? You want to have effective access to the institutions of government. So then he goes on and talks in terms of the two elements that an interest group need, right? These two elements of the conception of political process in the United States that are of crucial significance and that require special emphasis. These are first, the notion of multiple overlapping memberships. And second, the function of unorganized interests or potential interest groups. Okay, so again, before the, the protests of the summer of 2020, Black Lives Matter was a, an interest group or was a group that was maybe unorganized or maybe loosely organized on social media. And now after the protests, what happens is corporations are, and individuals want to contribute to them. So they have to start to formalize and make formal their organizational chart, who's leading what, organizing how, what parts of the country people are from, are you going to be a are you going to be a group that is um, associated with uh, different civil rights groups? Are you going to be associated with different groups that are that are, have been in that arena? These are questions that, of course, only they can answer. And if you are a member of the Black Lives Matter group, what happens to the, the other groups that you're a member of um, that may 
in time disagree with the objectives of that group. <clears throat> and then the si second function of an unorganized interest or a potential interest group, right? So uh, you have potential interest groups that bicycle riders, uh, bicycle riders in local government, especially in, in Southern California, have become a very, very active community group. They have resources, they have uh, changed many of the uh, streets in both Southern California, and they are active in uh, becoming a more formalized but potential interest group. Finally, young people, right? People who may have been exposed on college campuses to the Bernie Sanders campaign, or may have been uh, exposed to some other political candidate campaign, they are unorganized. And what happens, as I said, older people tend to vote, the data shows younger people do not. And most candidates, if you rely on a younger uh, person's vote, um, you tend to lose. That's just the, that's just the record that, that people have. You saw, again, in the 1968 video, Making of the President, you saw Eugene McCarthy uh, rely on young people's vote, and that's when there was a draft, and uh, Humphrey won. And Robert Kennedy, of course, was assassinated, so it's sort of... Uh, he, they were fighting for that youth vote. So what does this mean, right? What does this mean? And Truman goes on to quote James Madison on page 251. James Madison, whose brilliant analysis in the 10th essay in the Federalists, we have frequently quoted, relied primarily upon diversity of groups and difficulty of communication to protect the new government from tyranny of a factious majority. He barely touched on the notion of multiple memberships when he observed almost parenthetically, quote, besides other impediments, it may be remarked that where there is a consciousness of unjust or dishonorable purposes, communication is always checked by distrust in the proportion of the numbers who concurrence is necessary. It's very hard to keep a secret. But then he goes on and says, Truman says, this myth, there's a myth of this silent majority. There's this myth that some politics and some groups have that people are not represented by different interest groups. And he goes, and he says on page 252, others, I'm sorry, 251, others seeking a satisfactory means of accounting for the continued existence of the political system sometimes assume that it is the non-participant citizen aroused to unwanted activity who act as a kind of counterbalance to the solid masses that constitute the organized interest group. Although this phenomenon may occur in times of crisis, reliance upon it reckons insufficiently with the established observations that citizens who are non-participant in one aspect of governmental process, such as voting, rarely show much concern uh, for any phase of political activity. Multiple memberships is more important as a restraint upon these activities of organized groups than the rarely aroused protest of chronic non-participants. Now again, we are at a point in time where maybe that has changed. Maybe that is changing. We will see. We will see if the protests of the summer of 2020 mean anything in November of 2020. I don't know. But to think that there is a silent majority out there that is just watching and being quiet and all of a sudden is going to spring to action uh, either in support of these protests or in denial of these protests, um, Truman would say is highly unlikely. He goes on, any mutual interest, however, any shared attitude is a, is a potential group. A disturbance in the established relationships and expectations anywhere in society may produce new patterns of interaction aimed at restricting or eliminating the disturbance. So again, all of social media. Social media is new in relative terms, right? Especially when we're talking about politics and the political process. And so again, what is a potential group? This is the question that, again, Truman asks. So he says, okay, we have different memberships, multiple memberships, and we are, we are the group is in, is, is in uh, in incorporating our behavior so we get accepted into the group and then we turn around and we may have influence and change the group's behavior. 
So he goes on, these widely held unrecognized interests are what we have previously called, quote unquote, the rules of the game. Others have described these attitudes in such terms as systems of belief, as a general ideological consensus, and as a broad body of attitudes and understandings regarding the nature and the limits of authority. Each of these interests and attitudes may be wide or narrow, general or detailed. For the mass of the population, they may, lose and they may be loose and ambiguous. Though more precise and articulate at the leadership level, in any case, the rules of the game are interests, the serious disturbance of which will result in organized interaction and assertion of a fairly explicit claim for conformity. In the American system, the rules would include the values generally attached to the dignity of the individual human being, loosely expressed in terms of fair dealing, or more explicitly verbalized in formulations such as the Bill of Rights, they would embrace what we call, quote, the democratic mold, unquote, that is, the approval of forms for broad mass participation in the designation of leaders and the selection policies in all social groups and institutions. They also comprehend certain semi-egalitarian notions of material welfare. This is illustrative, not of an exclusive list of such interests. So again, he is talking about what happens when you have this sort of ideological uh, or this unexpressed expectation or rules of the game. Well, what happens and what could happen, of course, is that it is only articulated when those rules either change or when those uh, rules of the game are taken away certain groups. And this is, again, this is, we have seen this in our history, uh, especially with um, when it comes to this concept of what is a symbol, as we talked about previously, or the concept of what does it make, what, the, what are the ingredients of this quote unquote nation that we call the American nation. Again, we started the class talking about the preamble, popular sovereignty, rule of law, and tolerance. Other people would disagree, and other people would say, no, we want a racial, or we want a language, or we want a religious aspect in that, that nation. Well, that would change the rules of the game, wouldn't it? And so that would create uh, a, a different environment, and that would change those rules of the game. So again, that is uh, David Truman and his essay about uh, uh, about <clears throat> pardon me, lobbying groups and public the public policy process. And the next session we'll we'll talk about uh, Lowy's argument attacking this pluralistic pol politics model. And so we have Truman and Lowy basically debating on this process. Until then, stay safe.